Thank you, Brett, and um, good morning to one and all. Um, I'd first of all like to thank the Australian, the Royal Australian Navy for inviting me here to speak. I'm greatly honoured and for organising such a, a great event. Um, I think the theme for this, uh, for this event is, is so appropriate and so important to the individual economies in, within this region. Protecting our ability to trade requires an understanding of what challenges are currently being faced by the shipping industry in the Indian Ocean region and what are the major influences on the capacity of the industry to maintain efficient and productive services. These influences involve supply and demand factors as they impact on individual segments of our industry, the cost of environmental regulation, the increasing size of ships and the lack of port infrastructure to adequately cater for them. I will not only concentrate on international trends that impact on our region, although such impacts could be felt differently in different trade lanes, but also on the issues within the Australian context that could be applicable to uh, other economies in this region. This is an, indeed an important region. I'm not going to spend any time on this because um, we've heard a lot of it in, over the last day or so, so we know it is indeed important. To summarise the international shipping outlook, I can do no better than quote the President of the Baltic and International Maritime Council, BIMCO for short, when he said at the end of last year and forecasting developments for this year, it is estimated that across the bulk carrier, container and tanker fleets, there is 20% more tonnage than required. The oversupply is aggravated by very high bunker or fuel prices. On the one hand, this is forcing slow st steaming, that is absorbing some of the overcapacity. But on the other hand, it is driving the desire for more energy efficient ships, hence the new buildings. As a result, a, a worrying amount of ordering is taking place, adding tonnage to an already excessive world fleet. The ever, uh, I'm still quoting him, the ever increasing regulatory requirements impose significant costs on our industry at a time when it can ill afford them. We must stop allowing regulation to be developed without prior completion of a broad technical, environmental and impact assessment. Recently, the International Maritime Organisation, IMO, has shown itself to be pragmatic with a request for a fuel availability study, oil, fuel oil availability study by 2018 and a more realistic timetable for the fitting of onboard ballast water treatment systems. One bright spot in this gloomy outlook is LNG and we've heard a bit of that from previous speakers. In 2009, in the LNG market, uh, charter rates dropped to $30,000 a day, which is below cost recovery. But in 2012, they peaked uh, at $150,000 a day, dropping back to the $80,000 to $85,000 range, which is expected to be maintained over the next five years or so, and that's quite a viable charter rate. Um, just looking at the future, uh, certainly for this year, Naturally, we pay close attention to the forecasts of world trade growth and the IMF expects the 2014 global GDP and world import volume growth to hit a three-year high at 3.6 and 4.8 per cent respectively, which is encouraging, as is the expectation that growth in emerging markets and developing economies uh, will remain strong at 5.1 per cent, which is quite a high growth rate in 2014. However, as mentioned above, excessive ordering of new vessels and low scrapping idling rates for ships could apply a break on earnings in some sectors. As mentioned before, uh, a study by Ocean Shipping Consultants on Global LNG Trade and Trends in two th to 2030 forecast a rise in world LNG demand to over 570 billion cubic metres by 2020 compared to the estimated 310 billion cubic metres uh, today. And this would rise to over eight, 880 billion cubic metres in 2030, which would require an increase in the LNG fleet of 170%. Each of these ships uh, cost in the order of 350 million US dollars to build. Um, Australia uh, is well 
poised, as mentioned by an earlier speaker, uh, to become the second largest producer of LNG um, in, in the world. Um, in terms of dry bulk shipping, uh, we'll now look quickly at segment forecasts, dry bulk uh, tankers and containers. BIMCO expects a dry bulk demand to grow at 4.5 to 6% in 2014. There was a significant recovery in Cape size time charter, Cape size being over about 120,000 tonnes of cargo um, in September last year, reflecting strong demand and lower fleet growth in 2013, but this was short-lived. Both Supermax and Handymax, as smaller vessels, have enjoyed better earnings in the last 12 months, although if you look out one to three years, the time charter rates have barely moved. It is also interesting to note that the Baltic dry index fell 11% between October and December last year. In terms of tanker shipping, uh, very large crude carriers enjoyed an unexpected rally in freight rates in the final quarter of last year, but it has been a difficult year prior to that recovery. Uh, fleet growth in the crude oil tanker segment was expected to reach 2.3% in 2013, with around 15 via VL very large crude carriers and supermax vessels still to be delivered in 2014. There is an expected growth in demand for product tankers despite expected fleet growth in that area in 2014, but that is also a slight good blip uh, for, the, for that industry. Early this year, BIMCO expected the rates for both VLC and Supermax vessels to soften with rates for Aframac vessels to m remain more or less unchanged. Looking at containers, there's been a, a few successful general rate increases in the major trade lanes on the basis of deployed tonnage being balanced with demand but most have not been sustained and most have been unsuccessful. Nevertheless, the highest demand is being seen in the smaller trades, especially in the north-south trades, with bright prospects in terms of ASEAN economic activity in 2014. Regrettably, there are still signs that the market has reached saturation point. For example, spot uh, freight rates in the Asia to Australia container trade lane fell 65% last year. There has been some success with scrapping of vessels because they are slightly getting younger, those vessels being scrapped and larger than before. But those rates and those scrapping rates are certainly not keeping up with the growth in capacity. In 2013, new orders totaled 1.6 million TU. TU is a 20-foot uh, equivalent unit. In other words, a 40-foot container is two TUs. We always refer to container ships in, in, at times in terms of TUs. 52% of the new capacity contracted has been the ultra-large container ships being 10,000 TU and above, 35% being the range of 8,000 to 10, leaving only 13% for vessels below 8,000 TU. And I'll get on to increasing size of vessels very shortly. Um, MERS took delivery of its first 18,000 TU vessel a triple E class, they call it, uh, part of a 20 vessel order. And the United Arab Shipping Company has ordered five 18,400 TU vessels with an option for another one. As noted above, many major container shipping companies are ordering ULCVs, ultra-large container ships, meaning that the smaller container ships will cascade down into the north-south uh, trades. Um, clearly, the size of container vessels in particular is increasing rapidly, but also the size of, of cruise ships. Uh, the, the one you see in this slide is the Oasis of the Seas, um, uh, uh, which is uh, 225,000 gross tonnes. It is at the moment the largest container ship in the world, but it, uh, there are bigger ships being built as we speak. Uh, the biggest container ship to visit Australia is 152,000 uh, tonne, gross tonne, uh, Queen Mary II. Interestingly, that vessel, the Oasis of the Seas, has capacity of 8,000 passengers and crew, which raises some interesting problems if vessels of this size run into trouble in the middle of, of uh, for example, the Indian Ocean in terms of search and rescue. Um, <coughs> container vessels currently employed in Australian trades, uh, the larger ones are just over 5,000 TU to give you some uh, con context. But this size of vessel can be expected to increase quite rapidly in the relatively near future in the next five years to around 6,000 to 8,000 TU vessels, although an 8,000 TU vessel 
would be constrained by vessel drafts in Australian ports, which means that it, could, it may still be introduced, but it won't, uh, cannot sail at full capacity. Turning to the environment, uh, as mentioned before, the cost to the industry of, of new regula environmental regulations is, is mind-boggling, particularly when seen in the perspective of an industry striving to recover from the effects of the Great Recession and operating in a market of oversupply of ships, high volatility in freight rates and exorbitant, exorbitant fuel prices. Nevertheless, the industry is striving to meet its environmental challenges, and you'll see in this slide the reduction in, in oil spills. It's the number of reasons for this that have occurred uh, over the years. Still too many, as far as the industry is concerned. Um, but there has, the average age of the fleet is declining, so we have newer ships, which are more efficient. We have double-hulled tankers, of course, now throughout the world, which is um, part of the reason for this reduction in major oil spills. And uh, this is just a, you know, every time we talk about the environment, we've got to show that shipping is, of course, the most environmentally form, uh, uh, efficient form of transport compared to other transport forms, if you look at it, in terms of CO2 grams emitted per tonne kilometre travelled. That doesn't mean, of course, that the industry is not very conscious of its overall CO2 and greenhouse gas productions, and it's, it's certainly looking to do something about that and has been doing things about it, um, certainly with new builds. So in this slide, you will see that the industry is aiming for a 20% reduction in CO2 output at least by 2020 and a 50% reduction by 2050. So the international shipping industry is extremely conscious of the environmental challenge and is doing what it can uh, to, to meet it. The IMO convention requiring all vessels to have on board, finally approved by the IMO ballast water treatment systems, is expected to enter into force shortly. As mentioned earlier, whilst the schedule for the introduction of such systems on the approximate 55,000 large ships in the world uh, has been amended by the um, IMO and is considered to be more realistic, but it still could be difficult to meet the installation requirements. The current global limit for sulphur in heavy fuel oil is 3.5%, but this will be reduced to 0.5% of sulphur allowed in 2020, and in um, particularly sensitive areas it's, it's, it will be introduced much earlier. The global production capacity of these so-called middle distil distillates is limited and a big question is whether refiners will increase their capacity to produce the required volume. This is the basis of the IMO's oil availability study, which is scheduled for completion in 2018. If there is insufficient capacity, it will drive up the price of diesel, not only for the industry, but for everyone around the world, and particularly in this region. There are other problems with low sulphur fuel. It's been shown by a number of investigations that we've had a vessel failures, uh, sorry, engine failures from using these fuels, and, um, and also electrical uh, failures and blackouts. I won't go into that in the detail, but you can read about more about that in the paper uh, that will be published uh, following this symposium. An interesting alternative uh, could be coal processed on land to manufacture methanol which could be loaded onto ships for use as a fuel, even if only required nearing land, as it has several advantages over LNG. Nevertheless, both methane and LNG have a downside of the amount of space required to store it on board compared to current heavy fuel oils. Um, and this is certainly a problem for all non-LNG carriers, and it's something that uh, I'm sure that technology uh, will help us with in the future. I'd like to outline a, a number of initiatives that have been taken in Australia that I believe could be of interest to other countries uh, in this region. Um, in 2012, there was agreement between uh, the federal and state uh, governments in Australia, state and territory governments, on a national port strategy, and I'll leave you to read that uh, in the paper, but I think this is a major move forward. S ports are owned by the states, uh, primarily, uh, or private enterprise in, in Australia. Um, whereas the federal government has an extreme interest in their uh, productive productivity and efficiency objectives. What I'd really like to concentrate is on improved uh, sea traffic systems, which are presently available. Our Australian Mar uh, Maritime Safety Authority has developed these with the Australian Hydrographic Service 
and the West Australia's Department of Transport. This is the ones off uh, northwest Australia. There's also systems being developed off the northeast, uh, particularly in the Great Barrier Reef area. Um, and they've worked, but these three groups have worked together to establish a network of shipping fairways uh, off the coast, northwest coast of um, Western Australia, where there's, of course, a lot of uh, heavy traffic, both in terms of bulk uh, carriage, but also uh, with um, uh, floating and fixed uh, oil and gas platforms. The new fairways aim to reduce the risk of collision between transiting ships and offshore infrastructure. They are intended to direct large ships in the area into predefined uh, routes to keep them clear of existing and planned offshore infrastructure. There's, they are similar to the Dampier Shipping Fairway, which was chartered in 2007 and has proved to be successful in achieving its aims. While the use of the new fairways is strongly recommended, they are not mandatory and their use does not give any vessels any special right of way. Throughout the world, there are a number of projects looking at what might be possible in vessel tracking, route monitoring and planning. And one of the most interesting to me is the Mona Lisa project, which commenced in 2010, has just gone into the second phase. It's very all embracing, but I think it's certainly, and other similar world projects are looking towards uh, basically a blue highway where um, ships will, will be mandatorily uh, directed into um, the routes they take, particularly in uh, congested and highly sensitive areas. Uh, I now like to move on to um, the development of a, a maritime school of strategic thought, which um, uh, the Chief of Navy in Australia, Admiral Griggs, has suggested he, in a statement in a uh, speech last year. He mentioned this way of thinking strategically must recognise the increased pervasiveness of maritime trade and our national dependence on it for our ongoing prosperity which will give the Australian Defence Force a central role in a critical national mission, the protection of our ability to trade, the very thing that underpins our national prosperity and security. I could not agree more because the central fo focus of shipping policy is to facilitate trade, and the protection of, of our ability to trade is central to that debate. The primary focus uh, of the ADF is clearly enhancing defence capability and efficiently performing the tasks set by national governments. Whereas the primary focus of industry is productivity and competitiveness to deliver sustained long-term growth in revenue for shareholders. So they're not always compatible. But whilst this is an oversimplification, it also points to the area of common interests which should grow with the development of maritime strategic thought. One specific area of common interest in developing such a strategy that comes to mind, where we in fact can uh, grow that, that uh, orange balloon there, in other words, areas of common interest between industry and, and the Navy and Australian Defence Forces, um, would be um, developing a strategy, uh, could be in the investigation in the building of Australia, in Australia of two roll-on, roll-off vessels that could be provided by private interests to operate under licence and fully maintained in the coastal container bulk, bulk bulk trade between, for example, Sydney, Melbourne and Fremantle. We could have extra accommodation for training seafarers, including naval cadets, uh, strengthened decks for armoured vehicles and earth moving equipment, as well as a helicopter landing pad. And these vessels could also be used in uh, humanitarian response and in responding to natural disasters. With two weeks' notice, they would be released for use by the ADF. Um, and uh, regular shipper interests, in other words, shippers using these vessels, would need to be accommodated and protected under such arrangement in relation to service and freight rates, but this is not insurmountable and could be achieved. This would allow Australian flag vessels to more readily compete with road and rail transport on this trade route, as no capital to service trade would reduce the disadvantage of stevedoring costs, which is an inherent disadvantage in using shipping to move uh, freight around the coast. But I stress this is just one area of potential common interests. So if I could just um, summarise, I think I'm doing all right for time, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> um, internationally, the outlook for the Indian Ocean region is similar to other areas, but as mentioned, impacts could differ in individual countries. The outlook is not greatly, greatly optimistic for the shipping industry, except it is brighter. One good point is brighter than it looked in 2013. And 
uh, uh, LNG, product carriers, uh, product tanker carriers, car carriers and cruise ships have a bit of a brighter outlook than other segments of the industry. Volume-wise, most container trade lanes are not expecting significant growth except intra-Asia. However, the general consensus to be, as I mentioned, that this year could turn out better than last year. Vessels are rapidly increasing in size, primarily in the LNG container and cruise markets. As mentioned, this will cause the cascading down of the smaller vessels, considered smaller vessels, into this region and countries in the north-south trades. Environmental issues and current timetables internationally for the introduction remain a serious concern for the shipping industry. The search for a fuel source to replace heavy fuel oil continues, and this will be a major focus of interest for the, in of the industry in years to come. As, as I believe, new technology will undoubtedly play an important part in the eventual solution. Turning to more local issues that could be of interest to countries in the region, reference has been made to the National Port Strategy, which was introduced in 2012, to get a lot more coordination between port development and infrastructure development in our ports, and importantly, not just the ports, but the intermodal terminals that link to them, if we are going to avoid the congestion, particularly increasing containerisation, will impose on Australia if we do not do that. Of particular interest is the improved traffic systems introduced by AMSA, especially the network of shipping fairways off the northwest coast of Western Australia. As mentioned, a number of interesting projects worldwide investigating new vessel tracking, route monitoring and planning systems. Um, the Chief of Navy has suggested consideration be given to a Maritime School of Strategic Thought in Australia, and this concept has received broad support. There is a need to expand the area of con in common interest between the ADF and the maritime industry, and developing maritime strategic thought in Australia will go a long way in achieving that objective. Such a strategy will need to be fully aware of what's happening worldwide and in regions such as the Indian Ocean region. This series of seminars and symposium, symposia is an important step in that direction, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>